This morning, uh, we're going to be obviously in the book of Acts as we're in this unhindered series together. Uh, in the book of Acts, literally, you want to take your Bible and turn it to Acts chapter 15 this morning. We're going to be uh, at the end of 15 and the start of 16 talking a little bit uh, about this narrative that takes place. And I know <clears throat> that there's some embarrassing details, I think, in this story. Embarrassing details about the early church and what's going on. There's failure, there are disagreements, there's conflicts. Um, you know when you're trying to build something up, you're trying to tell a story about something that great that has happened, you kind of leave out the bad details. You don't, you don't share with everybody everything. I know, you know, when you're winning Super Bowls and you're, man, winning a lot of games, you don't talk to people about the, the footballs you've been deflating. You know, you don't go there. You don't tell everybody, you know, your strategy. I know. See, here's the deal. You know, I hate this morning uh, to agree with Pastor Aaron on as far as competition goes, but I know he's probably already, Fagan Bush, been talking about the Philadelphia Eagles. You know he is over there. But hey, I, well, I guess I'm going to have to side with him this time. But, you know, we leave out the bad stuff a lot of the time. But in this passage in Acts, you, you see some difficult things going on in the church. And they're not left out. And I think this is an encouragement for two reasons. Number one, I think the fact that these things are put in by Luke, the author, should add to our confidence as to the historical validity and the historical accuracy of the book of Acts. Like he's not making this, led, this is up as like a legend or something, that these are events that actually took place. But even more so, more than that, I think this is an encouragement to us that we see, that, hey, those in the early church, they weren't perfect. We're not perfect. They weren't perfect either. I know it's easy to put some of these guys or maybe the reformers or the apostles up on a pedestal, but they were men. They were men who were also sinners in need of a savior, and so this morning, as we look at this, I think this question kind of arises. I think we have this question up here. Can God use us to glorify himself despite our failures, our conflicts, and our disagreements? Can he do it? And I think that this text would show a resounding yes, he can. And he will and he does. And so as we're looking at this morning, I ask you that you would stand with me in honor of God's word. We're going to read starting chapter 15. Verse, verses 36 through 41. It says, And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I pray today that as we look at this text, Lord, full of failure, full of conflict, that we could see that, Lord, we have our own failures. Lord, but you are greater than that. Lord, and you have the power to bring restoration. I pray that you would convict our hearts, Lord, where we have fallen short, but you would also convict us of the truth of what you've done that we might find healing this morning. Lord, please just let your Holy Spirit just come all over this place right now, God. I'm asking to open our eyes and open our hearts to hear from you. Lord, I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As you may be seated. So first thing I really want to see is that God restores from failure and conflict for his mission. That's the first thing we're going to see. Then the second part here in a minute, we'll see that God prevents conflict for his mission. So first, seeing through this, the failure and the conflict, what we have is this situation that Paul and Barnabas, they're wanting to return to these places that they've planted churches, that they've spent time, they've seen people come to know Jesus. They want to go spend time there and strengthen them and make sure, you know, hey, everything is going well. But they've got this little team and there arises, it says, this sharp disagreement. All right, so I'm telling you, there, in the beginning of chapter 15, it says there arose no small dissension among the brothers. And now it's saying there was a sharp disagreement. All right, this isn't like they're kind of like, oh, I disagree. Like, man, they're throwing bows over these things. No, maybe not that far. But they're disagreeing sharply. They're upset about the opinions of one another here. 
And specifically, what you have is this guy named John called Mark. And apparently, when they were on their first missionary journey, you can see in Acts 13, verse 3, that John Mark withdrew from the work. And we don't really know what happened. We don't know if he got nervous, if he kind of backed down in face of persecution, if um, he just backed off. And, but for whatever did, he pulled back and he failed. And there was some kind of moral failure in terms of commitment to the gospel. Well, Paul has kind of a sour taste in his mouth about this, and he's looking at it, and he doesn't want John Mark to accompany them. But Barnabas, on the other hand, does. And I think the reason for this is that, you know, sometimes there comes down to decisions that it's tough to know what's right or wrong. It's tough to know who's right in this thing, because I think Paul and Barnabas are asking two different questions about John Mark. First, looking at Paul, I think Paul's looking at John Mark, and he's saying, what can this man do for the Lord? What can this man do for the Lord? Because he knows, Paul knows, they are about to go into some places where there's some pretty intense debates about the law and about circumcision and about the gospel, and that they're going to go into some hostile synagogues where Jews are not liking this man, Jesus, that they're proclaiming. And he's thinking, if this guy withdrew before and he was unfaithful before, I'm, I'm worried about bringing him alongside again. So he's worried about his qualification kind of in ministry. You know, I had this guy with me one time and as I was, uh, there's this place I spent time at several years ago and I spent a lot of time sharing Christ there, sharing with people who Jesus is. And this guy, I got to know him a little bit, we were friends and he asked me if he could go with me. And I was like, absolutely, I would love to have a teammate. Like, come on. Like, so I brought, it, brought him in there and just, you know, just kind of build relationships, hang out. And I, I heard him start talking to this one guy that I already knew. And it's like all of a sudden he went from, you know, being cool and, you know, being kind to, man, his like tone and everything switched when he started talking about spiritual things. And he was just, it just got really weird. And this guy who knew me looked at me and was like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh man. But anyway, it's like, so I, I still, man, I still love this guy and I'm still friends with him to this day, but I thought it better, you know, I better not take him back in there because I don't want somebody to kind of be pushed away because there was kind of a, a whole different type of demeanor taken when started talking about Jesus. Man, if, if Jesus is the king, if he's our Lord, that it should be one flow all the time. It should be flowing out of us all the time in one way. There shouldn't be like two different lives, a dichotomy. And so Paul sees this, and he's a missionary, he's a church planner, he's an evangelist, and he's worried about this guy withdrawing. On the other hand, I think Barnabas, it says, he wants to take him to Cyprus. He wants to take him to Cyprus, or not to Cyprus. He's wanting to take, the, take John Mark with him. Barnabas, I think, is asking a different question than Paul. Paul's asking, what can this man do for the Lord? And Barnabas is asking, what can the Lord do for this man? I think both are good questions. Both are questions that we have to ask because it's important to be qualified in terms of ministry and leadership. But on the other hand, it's important that we restore people when they struggle and when they fail. And Barnabas, in Acts chapter 4, he's given the nickname, Son of Encouragement. All right, so we know the type of guy Barnabas was. If you were around him, he was lifting you up. He was like pulling you up. He's like, come on, man. You know, you know the type of people in your life that are like this. You know, you may be sitting by someone who's an encourager right now. If you're sitting by an encourager, I want you to just nudge him on the, nudge him on the shoulder and say, How, I want to thank you for being an encourager. And you're going to encourage them in their encouragement, right? Because we need this in the body. We need people who are willing to encourage others despite conflict despite failure. And this is what Barnabas is after. I know one time, I'm always amazed at what people say, like what people think they need to share with you. I, I don't know why, you know, I preached this Sunday night service one time and I preached the Sunday morning service also. And this woman came up to me and she kind of crossed her arms and looked at me and she said, well, this morning was, hmm, <laughs> but tonight was okay. <laughs> I was like, man, I was like, thank you so much for your encouragement. You're so, you know, you're so wonderful. You know, but this is what happens. And you know that type of person in your life too. Don't thank them for that, all right? <laughs> but we need encouragers who are willing to come along. We need to come alongside people despite their failure. And that's what Barnabas is doing, knowing that 
We're not, Philippians 2.14, we're to do everything without grumbling and complaining. Ephesians 4.29, we're to let no corrupting talk come out of our mouths. And the criteria of what is not corrupting is that which is building up of others, which fits the occasion and gives grace to those who hear, according to Paul. So that, you know, shuts out a lot of what comes out of our mouths, probably. And so Barnabas, being the son of encouragement, also We know he's a cousin of John Mark, all right? And so you know how it is. Other people can leave your family in the dust, but you can't leave your family in the dust. You gotta gotta stick with your family. They're yours. And I think Barnabas feels, you know, some responsibility to him. And so you see both of these guys doing this, but ultimately what we have as a result of it is restoration. On all different levels, we look at each of these. We have restoration from personal failure with with John Mark. We have restoration from conflict between Paul and John Mark. And we have restoration from conflict between Paul and Barnabas. First, looking at John Mark, we know from elsewhere in Scripture, in Philemon 24, and specifically in 2 Timothy 2.11, that he obviously was restored to ministry. Because Paul, in 2 Timothy 2, says, bring John Mark along with you. For he is very useful to me in ministry. The same guy, he didn't want to go with him. He said, bring him. So while something has gone on in John Mark's life, despite his failure, despite whatever he got scared or he backed down from persecution, and how did this healing, how did this restoration come about? I think it came about through community. It came about through the discipleship of Barnabas. Barnabas take him to Cyprus, his hometown, somewhere that was comfortable, encouraged him, built him up, and there he was able to grow up and to be a leader, to grow up past these failures. If you look in 1 John 1, 9, we should have this verse. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So firstly, in our failure, man, we go to God through Christ because of what he's done. And that's where we find forgiveness. That's where we find the cleansing from sin, right? But there's even more, and I think we often leave this one out. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray to one another that you may be healed. This is what was going on in John Mark's life, in his failure. He was not only confessing his failure to God, but he was letting people come around him so that he could find healing of it. This is what brings healing, is community. It's the relationships of discipleship, something we're passionate about here at Highview. And when I say discipleship, is that someone who is a believer, disciple is a young believer of how to grow up in the faith, of know what it looks like to follow Christ. And this is what happened here in his life and this community. And I wanna say the same thing to you today. You may feel like John Mark, you feel like, man, I've, blown, I've done something that people know I've done, and I don't, I don't know if it's re- reconcilable. I've failed in some way, in some kind of moral failure, and people know what I've done, and I don't think at this point people are going to listen to me if I talk about Jesus. I don't know if they're going to listen to me if I want to serve in the church. And this passage says the exact opposite. It says, despite your failure, how far you have fallen, that Christ is there, that forgiveness is in Christ's name, and that the Christian community longs to come aside one another and help build each other up to restoration. And further, we see that they're reconciled from conflict. First, with obviously Paul and John Mark of what he said, but also with Paul and Barnabas. We know elsewhere in Paul's later later letters, he talks highly of Barnabas that I think what happened is despite their conflict, they had a greater mission. They were willing to put that behind them for the mission of God so that the gospel could go forth in that area, just like it was, and so that churches could be established. In the same way, some of you may, all of us experience personal failure, right? Some of you may be particularly struggling with failure, but some of you may be specifically struggling with conflict. And maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's within this very church. I've seen in in, in one of the churches I was in, I saw two people not talk to each other for over eight years, wouldn't speak to each other in the church. Like that is devastating. But it's amazing what conflict can do. But I think we have to decide what is more important. That conflict and the grudge that I'm holding or the forgiveness and the restoration that Christ has done despite us being enemies 
and us putting that behind us for the mission of God. So you may need to go to somebody today that you've had a struggle with and say, brother, sister, I know we've had our differences, but I want you to know Jesus is bigger than this. And I want to be reconciled to you. Man, with that beautiful, the unity that that brings. All of this is, of course, for the mission of God. It says by the end of the text that Paul was commended by the brothers, by the grace of the Lord. And so they went out and they went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches because of everything that happened. The churches were strengthened. And not only that, despite the failure, despite the conflict, you know what God did in his sovereignty is they ended up with two mission teams instead of one. They got two different groups now going out. And so I'm not saying conflict is prescriptive, like we should have conflict so we can be greater missionaries. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that God uses it, despite your failure, despite what conflict you have in your life. And I'll just mention one more thing. Maybe the personal failure you're struggling with is not your own personal failure, it's somebody else's personal failure. Specifically, I think I talk to so many people. I'm telling you, I talk to multiple people a week who say they have a struggle coming in the church because of something that's happened to them within the church or within church leadership. And you know what? I really sympathize with that. I want you to know this morning, if something has happened, that is understandable. It is hard to see somebody fall in ministry. It is really hard to experience somebody else's personal failure that has a deep effect on your life. But at the same time, we cannot look to man. We cannot look to man as this standard, as if he's not gonna fail us, because man, we will fail each other every single time if that's who we're counting on. So I wanna encourage you that God restores from failure and conflict for his mission. In the second part, in chapter 16, verses one through five, God prevents conflict for his mission. Let's read 16, one through five together. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him and he circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches, again, were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. So this time, we don't have a conflict. We're gonna have a conflict prevented, all right? But it's important, I think, first, let's look at Timothy. So this is the first appearance you have, really, of Timothy, of talking about this young man, of course, who Paul's letters of First and Second Timothy were directed towards. And Timothy, he's the son of this Jewish woman. His father's a Greek. You've got this mixed ancestry going on. But because of the discipleship of his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois, he experienced salvation in Christ. And this is something, a side note to see in 2 Timothy, that the reason Timothy was a believer was because of his parent. That that's where discipleship starts. The church is not the primary response, does not have the primary responsibility of discipleship for children. It's the parent. Amen. But the church does have the responsibility to equip those for doing so at the same time. But Timothy, he's this guy, it says in the text, was spoken of well. He was well spoken of by the brothers in Lystra and Iconium. And so I think it's important to note, this is not just saying like, oh, you know, old Timothy, he was a good old boy. Like, you know, he's a good guy. Like, this is saying something way bigger than that. The language that's used here is used a few different places in Acts. And every time, it is a very great compliment. In Acts chapter 6, it says the apostles had to go search out seven men of good reputation. It's the same phrase. Seven men of, who were well spoken of, full of the spirit, and they were to go serve tables and to serve widows. That was the requirement in the early church to serve tables is you had to be full of the spirit. That's some high qualifications. But what this is saying about Timothy is, man, the spirit of God is on this man. Like, this is not like he's just a good guy. This is the churches around there could tell that this man was living by the power of Jesus Christ. And it was evident to everybody around him. And you know in your lives somebody like that, who you know when you're around them, they're constrained by the Spirit. That they're led by the Spirit in the way that they talk, in the way that they treat others, in the way that they exalt Christ in their life, in their holiness. 
And I think we should all long for this to be true of us right here. What's true of Timothy? Not for our own attention, not for our own, not for our own sake, but for the glory of God, that somebody could see the marks of God on our lives. And so Timothy, well spoken of, Paul identifies him. Paul sees this guy and he's like, wow, I hear the reputation of this guy. I've seen him. I wanna take him alongside me and raise him up to leadership. And I think this is a big thing within the church is that number one, when somebody comes to faith, we identify them and help them know what it looks like to follow Jesus. But at the same time, when we see the marks of the spirit on someone in a, in a special way and they have giftings, maybe to teach or to serve, that we identify that. And we help encourage them in it. And this is what Paul does right here. He identifies him, but then he does something that doesn't make sense in light of last week and in light of the, the, the Jerusalem council and the decisions reached there. Is he has Timothy circumcised when they go to where the Jews are. So let's back up. Because I think before we talk about prevented conflict right here, it's important to know why there's conflict, maybe conflict in the first place. And so last week with the Jerusalem council, there were these decision reached about the Gentiles, that Gentiles, non-Jews, could actually be saved through faith in Christ. But also that they didn't have to be circumcised necessarily, right? The Gentiles, they don't have to necessarily follow in circumcision. And Paul, when he takes Titus to, to, with, around the Galatian church, as you see in Galatians 1, Titus, whose mother and father is a Greek, Paul doesn't circumcise him. Right, so what's this circumcision thing all about? Why aren't we talking about this right now? In the old covenant, with the 10 commandments that were given to God, given to Moses from God, in the old covenant, there was an agreement, a promise between God and the people of Israel that they were to obey him and he would bless them in the land, but if they disobeyed, they would be cursed and they would actually be driven out of the land. And that's exactly what happens. But to be a part of the old covenant, to be a part of the people of Israel as a male, you were circumcised on the eighth day after your birth. This was the mark that you were a member of the old covenant. And if you were a Gentile, a non-Jew who wanted to come in and be a part of the people of God, you would also, you'd have to be circumcised. So this is the mark. But the thing is, couldn't anyone keep the old covenant perfectly? No man, no man can keep the, we have anybody who has kept the 10 commandments perfectly in here? That's good you didn't raise your hand because then you'd have lied and then you'd have broken it. So, right? Nobody can keep this thing. Why? It's because God's standard is perfection and we're born sinful. And so obviously the new covenant is about the solution to all of this. And with the new covenant, Hebrews says the old covenant is obsolete. It's over. It's ended. Why? It's because Jesus Christ, born as a Jew, circumcised on the eighth day, lived a sinless life in obedience to the law. He lived a sinless life that you and I can't ever hope to live and fulfilled the requirements of the law. And then what does he do? He goes and dies in our place. He goes taking on the condemnation that you and I deserve, the death that you and I deserve. He takes it upon himself as a substitute and is raised up from the dead to establish the new covenant. And what is the promise of the new covenant? It's really simple. We're all sinners falling short of the glory of God. But if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You will be forgiven of your sin. And this applies to every single person in this room. You have all, we have all fallen short of God's glory. And the new, but the new covenant promises this, that through Christ, belief in him, you have his righteousness upon you. It's not yours. You didn't earn it. And you're like, so okay. But why are we still talking about all this circumcision stuff? This isn't relevant today, but it is relevant today. It just looks different. And I'm very weary of hearing claimed Christian after Christian share about their salvation and their testimony and there's no Jesus in it. This plays itself out, this circumcision idea, this works, this obedience to the law. It plays itself out when you hear somebody say something like, well, you know, I just do my best to be a good person and I think God will forgive me. He won't. Well, I just, you know, I just try to love my family and take care of them and do the best I can. I think God will have mercy. No, he won't. He won't. Well, I was, I was baptized. No. 
It is by faith in Jesus Christ alone that a person can find forgiveness with God. Because he's the only one who's paid the debt. It's not, Pastor Aaron talked about last week, it's not Jesus plus circumcision. It's not Jesus plus baptism. It's not Jesus plus you fill in the blank. If there's a blank, it's wrong. And if your testimony does not include Jesus, you don't have one. And I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just telling you, I'm warning you. Because the wrath of God is coming for sinners. Like you and me. Everybody in here. And if there has never been a time in your life where you had bowed before the king who was slaughtered as the lamb of God that we just sung about, and you have never come before him and placed your faith in him and given yourself to him wholly, you are still in your sins and condemned under that same law. And I plead with you to turn from your sin and believe in Christ. There is no other way. There is no other option. And this is what Paul is so passionate about in this text. And so we do in all of this to get to this answer of why he has Timothy circumcised. Because it's not necessary, right? We just established it's by faith alone in Jesus Christ through his grace that we are saved. So why is he doing this? Because Paul and Timothy, despite the fact that they know that they don't need circumcision to be saved, they're going to prevent a conflict by doing so. Because they understand this truth. They know it's by Jesus alone. But they also know that everybody knows that Timothy, his father, is a Greek. And what's the main thing those Jews are going to be worried about when they walk in the door? That issue. And so what Paul says is, hey, look, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake that there is no obstacle whatsoever, let's just go ahead and get this taken care of. That way Jesus can be the center focus. And that's what's going on. They're trying to take away every obstacle to prevent any conflict from happening in the church. And specifically, I want to read, I think, really Paul's heart right here in Galatians 5, verses 13 and 14. Paul says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul's thoughts are, yes, we have freedom not to do this. Yes, we have freedom in Christ. But more importantly with my freedom is that I'm supposed to count others more significant than myself to remove obstacle. And so I say, how how does this apply today? Well, I think it can apply in a million situations. Let's say, for example, that you've met a Muslim man or woman and you're going to go have, you're going to have them over for dinner to your house. They've agreed to come and you want to talk with them and get to know them and love them and talk to them about Christ. You know what you don't need to bring for dinner? Pork. You don't want, don't do it. Yes, you have the freedom to eat it. Praise God. Jesus has filled the, the new covenant and we can eat what we want, right? But that doesn't mean you have to use that freedom. Man, that's, that's just going to prevent an, present an obstacle, Maybe it's a Jehovah's Witness that you're trying to spend time with. They've agreed to spend time with you. You don't want to take them out cutting down Christmas trees because Jehovah's Witnesses view Christmas trees as idolatry. And so you're you're just trying to avoid that. And in the same way, in this point, I want young people in here especially to listen to me. We have freedom of speech in America and we have all kinds of freedoms, but freedom of speech and some of these freedoms doesn't mean there's not freedom of consequence. There's still consequence to the things we say and we do, even if we have the freedoms to do it. And sometimes, for the sake of our brothers, for the sake of the gospel and those who do not know Christ, man, we just need to keep our mouths shut for God's glory. And so in all these things, Paul says, do not, in Romans 14, 21, do not eat meat or drink wine or do anything that would cause your brother to stumble. But even though there's with this, this truth, right, that we may have to give up something or do something and so that there's not an obstacle. And hey, and hear me clearly, I'm not talking about compromising on sin. I'm not talking about compromising values. I'm talking about cultural norms, traditions, and things that, hey, might have effect. But there's another side to this issue. There's another side to this issue. And it's when we develop, when we're walking with Jesus, and hey, I wanna tell you guys, I think this is a great thing. You're walking with Jesus and you are convicted about something particular in your life that you're not gonna do anymore because it's not good for you. 
Maybe you don't want to see a rated R movie. I don't know. People develop all kinds of convictions that are their own. And that is wonderful. I think we should strive to do things like that as long as we don't think those things are saving us. But as soon as you think that everyone else ought to obey that conviction, you've gone astray. I want you to read this, hear, read this quote was from C.S. Lewis from me. One of the marks of a certain type of bad man is that he cannot give up a thing himself without wanting everyone else to give it up. That is not the Christian way. An individual Christian may see fit to give up all sorts of things for special reasons. Marriage or meat or beer or the cinema. But the moment he starts saying that things are bad in themselves or looking down his nose at other people who do use them, he has taken the wrong turning. Lewis is such a, a great thinker. Uh, you know, I was in my home church one time a long time ago, back when I was a kid, and this boy had come in to serve on this ministry team who we didn't know was a believer or not, but we were trying to talk to him. My, my dad specifically was trying to minister to him and see if he knew Christ. And he parked in this spot you just don't park as a young person, okay? Like, that's where the people who have trouble getting around park. It's close to the door. Well, man, he doesn't know anything, and he parks up right next to this right next to this way. And some older man in the church came up and got his finger in his face and started blowing him out for parking right there. You think he came back next week? He has no idea. All I'm saying is sometimes people aren't where we are in terms of our conviction level, in terms of the tradition, in terms of the culture. And I say this all to say this, that when it comes to helping build others up, when it comes to reaching the law, sometimes we have to take precautions about what we're doing, what we're saying. And in the same way, sometimes we may have to change things in terms of culture and tradition in order to reach those who don't know Christ and be willing to do so. But again, not compromising on sin. And all of this, why are they doing all this in short? Again, God's doing all this for his mission. It's that there's no obstacle because what happens at the end of this text is that Paul delivers all the decisions from the Jerusalem council. And it says this, the churches were strengthened in faith and they increased in numbers daily. They increased in numbers daily. What was this going on? Well, what was going on was that there was selflessness of the people, there was clarity of the mission and of the decisions and there was unity of the body, healing and restoration going on and man, they were proclaiming Jesus and they were going forward. And I ask you this morning, are you on God's mission? Are you on your own? And as our musicians come up here, we're gonna have a time of invitation. All right, we're gonna have a time of invitation and we can respond, you can choose to respond in all different kinds of ways. Maybe there's some specific personal failure that's in your life that is just weighing you down. And you just need restoration. Maybe you wanna come pray about that. Maybe it's not failure. Maybe there's a conflict in your life you wanna come pray about. Maybe you just, hey, say, man, I, I've just not been living fully for the mission of God and I've got to get on board with this thing. Or maybe the case is, when I was talking earlier, is you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and you know if you were to die right now, you're going to die in your sin. I encourage you, whatever it is, we must physically respond. Man, I would just love to see this church get up here and pray just for the sake of praying. I took a survey this week in a specific group in a specific survey around this church. And the main struggle was prayer, spending extended time in prayer. And we wonder why the 21st century church is so devoid of power, so devoid of the spirit. Man, we gotta ask the one who has the power, who's bought it, who's purchased it. And so I ask you, whatever it is, man, could we respond as a church this morning? and to live for one another and live for God and what he's done through Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, I just praise you for this morning and the people of Highview, God. You are incredible of what you're doing in this place. Lord, and we owe our lives to you. Would you help us to lay them down, God? I know the failures in my life and the conflicts in my life, Lord, and I pray that you would heal me of those things. Lord, would you help us to surrender fully to you, but to know, God, no matter what's gone on in our life, no matter what conflict, there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Lord, would we let that settle in our hearts, and I pray this in Jesus' name.